Welcome to the ONS Energy Talks. My name is Anne Ekan, and it's my pleasure to host today's talk. We're constantly subject to rapid and significant changes in technology, in the global energy landscape, and the economy. In this respect, the COVID pandemic changed our lives dramatically, virtually overnight, in almost every way possible. How can we best navigate through a rapidly changing world and a crisis like this one? Our guest at today's ONS Energy Talks, Katie Mennett, is the founder and CEO of Pink Petro, the global community aimed at disrupting the gender gap in energy. In 2017, she launched Experience Energy, the only global careers platform aimed at delivering the energy transition. She's also founder of Lean in Energy, a global nonprofit devoted to mentoring. Katie has held global leadership roles with BP and Shell in safety and environment during periods of financial crisis, spills, divestment, and globalization. She's now dedicated to help energy companies prepare for talent shortage and workforce diversity needs to address energy poverty as well as climate change. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today, Katie. Thanks for having me. So first and foremost, how are you and your family doing in the midst of everything? You know, I think considering all the crises I've had to endure in my life, uh, we're doing we're doing quite well. We're just a bit isolated, uh, and I think ready to uh, to get back to normal life, whatever that new normal is. Yeah. So you're in Houston, and uh, we've spoken to some people in Houston a while back. Uh, could you give us a a quick snapshot of the state of the energy industry in Houston at the time and the situation in general. Absolutely. So, uh, oil had an epic fall a couple of weeks ago. I believe it was two weeks ago. Uh, went into negative territory. Unfortunately, uh, with the coronavirus and lowering demand due to the lack of activity and oversupply, uh, we're starting to see uh, the market really have an impact on the workforce. So, it started with four lows. Uh, now layoffs, and I think we'll probably see activity into later this year in terms of um, reductions. But uh, we did a study not too long ago with the University of Houston Energy, and I think the the good news is that the workforce believes the the industry on the whole has handled its response to the coronavirus well, um, and so that's uh, I, th I think that's a that's a kind of one of the silver linings in um, the situation that's happening here on the ground in Houston. Yeah, we were all um, already alluding to all the changes that comes out of a crisis like this one. Uh, I know you've been through some crises in the past, including Hurricane Harvey flooding in, in Texas. I've also seen you refer to why waste the crisis as being your mantra. Um, what have you learned from past? Uh, you know, we learn a lot from from crisis. What do you think will be the most important learnings and the most important changes coming out of this one? You know, I think that until people experience profound loss or pain, there's no incentive to change. Uh, and so what I found is that through crisis, we generally get more creative. We come through with more innovative ideas. Uh, and so my past experience with crisis has taught me that every time I've gotten through, I've gotten to through the other side and made out pretty, pretty well. So um, our industry is going through a lot of transition that was happening well before the coronavirus. I don't think that that's going to slow down. I think we're gonna to continue to see uh, a lot of disruption, but I also think it's a period of opportunity. Uh, many years ago, pandemics have come and gone in our past and we've seen societies flourish after uh, these, these situations. So I think that, that there's an opportunity, there's a real opportunity here to emerge a stronger, a more sustainable industry. Uh, the industry is going through, you know, there's innovation is driving the industry forward and always has. And, uh, you know, you work both in big corporates and in, in the more entrepreneurial community. Um, do you see, how do you see innovation? Do you, do you think this will hold some of the more technical innovation for a while? Do you think companies will be reluctant to put resources into do innovation or do you think innovation will, will continue or maybe just take a break and, and bounce back even stronger? I actually believe that innovation is going to move forward. And I think obviously a key component of innovation are people, uh, people mindsets, being able to see things differently, 
Uh, I oftentimes and more recently have been, you know, asked over and over, will diversity and inclusion take a back seat uh, with the coronavirus, with the current market situation? And I really don't believe that. And, and will, you know, will climate change take a back seat? I think that those ships have been sailed. I think that the industry, I think that the investment community, um, and I think overall society has said, look, we want a more diverse and inclusive workforce. We want a more sustainable energy system. And the way to get there is through innovation and people. So uh, I think there's gonna be a lull. This is very difficult. It's painful, it slowed us all down. But in some ways, I think the world needed a bit of a, a slowdown in order to, to recognize and appreciate uh, what's truly important. That was a great bridge into my next question because I know you took a step out of corporate life and established the big global network, Pink Petro. Uh, can you tell us a bit about Pink Petro and its mission? Sure. So uh, I always tell people I have a friend, uh, a very good friend of mine, who who says she got into an accidental business. My my business was an accidental business as well, and typically that's what happens with entrepreneurs. Uh, they find a gap and they want to fill it, and so. I was on a plane, actually, as most people do. A lot of people in Houston are in planes between here and, and say, Norway or, um, you know, London. And I was coming home from a business trip many years ago. And I sat next to a gentleman who struck up a conversation with me about why I wasn't at home with my daughter. And, um, and that conversation ensued. And at, at some point, he asked me very directly, what's a pretty young lady like you doing in a dark, dangerous business like oil? And I thought to myself, these are two things I want to fix. First and foremost, women and men can, uh, you know, do each other's jobs, right? There should not be um, a reason why not. And the second being this notion of dark and dangerous. You know, what we do is is absolutely risky. Uh, a lot of things have uh, risks, but energy powers the world. And I believe that the energy narrative uh, has been distorted. I believe the energy narrative in some places has been non-existent. And so the goal was to create a digital um, movement, so to speak, right? Using people's voices, the people that do the work, highlighting and spotlighting the work with the goal of trying to attract more people into our, our sector. So, uh, you know, I didn't have it all figured out. I think a lot of people thought, oh, I just, you know, kind of plopped down and started a business. Um, I followed what I thought, you know, the the community wanted and um, sat down with a number of large companies and, and asked lots of questions. Uh, and before you know it, I had, you know, uh, Halliburton came forward, Shell came forward, and they said, let's do this. And so we launched actually right in the middle of the last downturn. So um, it's been five years and we've had massive growth uh, uh, since. But what we essentially do is we bring the companies together to learn more about how we can drive um, that diverse and inclusive workforce, how we can uh, create a unique value proposition or an industry value proposition. And then we also reach and touch the individuals who are in the organization. So right now, a lot of what we do is we're providing a lot of outplacement support. We're providing a lot of you know leadership development support. By doing that though, um, on a digital platform. So the coronavirus in many ways um, has actually accelerated our work. Um, it's proven that you can in fact leverage technology uh, to include people and to provide accessibility. Um, and then there's another component of what we do, which is is around recruitment. Obviously right now um, we're not in a, in a cycle where we're hiring, but my, my forecast is that we're gonna be short. And we will be short uh, when this is when this is over and when demand does pick up. We were short before that uh, because we've got such a short pipeline of, of folks coming into the industry. So it's my mission to keep moving forward as long as uh, my, I've got my health and as long as I'm um, I can survive this coronavirus with everyone else. That's great. So is the situation in terms of the number of women in in in, in the energy industry and in leadership positions? Is it better than most of us think or worse than most of us think? And what does it take to boost? You talk about networking, some mentoring, other other things that we should do more of too? Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, my background is in health and safety and environment and more on the human behavior side. And one of the things I learned working for both Shell and BP is that, um, is that diverse and inclusive teams drive better, uh, safer and more reliable, uh, right, um, output and as well as financial. And so one of the things I, 
I liken inclusion to is, is we have to embrace it beyond just kind of ticking a box, right? So the industry got um, its, its dose of the need for safety many, many decades ago. Um, and we've embraced that as a part of our, our value system. I think too often in the past, though, diversity has been a priority, but not necessarily a value. And the difference between a value and a priority is that values don't change. You know, priorities do. So this this economic situation right now is really going to be a test to many companies and the industry as a whole to see if we can um uh, truly see that, hey, we've embraced, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion as a value. But I also believe that diversity and inclusion is super, super important because of the period we're entering. We need different ideas. We don't just need women. We need people of different backgrounds. We need people, um, you know, from all over the spectrum. We need people um, and and um, and ideas in order to drive uh, change forward. So I think what we need to do above above all else is to make diversity and inclusion uh, a value, make it a part of our DNA. Right, that's great. And you truly believe it, that it will be so important to drive the energy transition forward. Um, do you want to say a few more words about that? You said uh, about different yeah. ideas. And yeah, no, sure. I think that I think that uh, I believe I believe, and I know that diversity drives different outcomes. It gives. Um, it gives uh, a chance for ideas to flourish, but we have to create and support the environment in which to do that. And that gets back to, you know, what culture are we creating? Um, you know, I we've re we've gotten to where we are today around energy because let's face it, a lot of the same people are leading us into the have led us into this direction. My belief, though, is that more women, more people of color, um, people from different backgrounds, people from outside of the industry are going to be uh, necessary to drive the energy transition forward. Yeah, yeah. Listening to one of your Zoom at noon sessions, one of the topics that you discussed was how the E in ESG, Environment, Society, Governance, may disappear or be replaced by R as in resilience. Um, and uh, how do you think, how do you expect that the energy conversations will change coming out of COVID? Because I guess this was, you know, put in the perspective of COVID that we maybe have to change our priorities. No, absolutely. I think it's a great question. You know, I think resilience is, is a key attribute that all of us obviously need to take on. This world has um, has changed a lot. You know, when I came out of university, the rate of change was nowhere near what it, you know, what it is today. And and that means things are going to be changed. We've got to be flexible. But we we really need to have a what I call a marathon mindset. Companies, um, I think the the commodities industry has driven you know, a, a mindset around driving a, you know, company quarter to quarter and, you know, profitability. And I agree, look, we, you have to make money, right? Um, the point is to make money, but I think we also have to look at the bigger picture, which is companies that are going to last companies are going to be here, you know, um, you know, for the long term, and companies that are going to do the right thing. Uh, and, th and those can exist. You can have a company that uh, does the right thing, that um, employs a, diver a diverse workforce, that is resilient, uh, that provides energy to the world. And so I think it's a huge opportunity for the energy sector to step forward. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity to uh, separate what I call kind of, you know, the men from the boys and, you know, the women from the girls. You know, we're going to have a lot of, uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to have a lot of losers in this next downturn, we're going to see a lot of shedding of um, companies. We'll see, see a shedding of jobs, jobs that will go away, but there will be new jobs. There'll be new opportunities and resilient companies are made of resilient workers and resilient leaders. But that definitely means we have to have a different mindset. We have to think longer term um, and we also have to be um, uh, we have to focus on on creating a culture in which we can thrive and uh, drive our businesses forward in a more sustainable way. So I, I you know, we, we had a really neat debate about that not too long ago. And um, and I, I, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement that maybe we'll add the R 
to the ESG. I don't know that we're going to remove though uh, the E out of ESG. I believe, like I said earlier, that 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 ship has sailed. Yeah, hopefully we won't remove the E. Um, during COVID, many employers have seen that it's possible to work from home and to be very productive. And for women who are both professionals and mothers, um, this may be the needed additional flexibility for them to be able to continue to pursue a career after they have children. Um, they say rain is followed by rainbows. May this be just one of them? Yeah, it's a great point. 70% of the people that we recently surveyed uh, with the University of Houston Energy, 70% of the energy workers said if they had the decision today, they wouldn't return to the office. And so I think that's a huge uh, testament to the fact that the workforce is saying we want that flexibility. Uh, conversely, many of the C-suites I've spoken with over the last several weeks have said, you know, our mental model around virtual working has changed. We've proven that we can be productive. Um, by working uh, remotely. And so many companies are looking at for looking forward to, you know, moving that uh, forward as a part of the work environment. I think uh, the, the stress, though, that's going to come um, into play, at least particularly just in the next couple of months, is that, you know, the work life interface is where conflict occurs, you know, um, when you have younger children, and the schools are closed, and maybe the, the camps are closed, right? You know, what do we do uh, with children? This particularly puts an added strain um, on women. And in particular, you know, um, single parents, not and not just uh, single mothers, but single fathers. So I think the industry is a huge opportunity to leverage the experience through COVID. It kind of pushed us into pretty immediately a situation where we had to, to learn how you know, to work virtually. I think on the other side of this, if I look at it from a pure business perspective, it's 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 a good thing to do from a flexibility perspective and culture perspective. But we're just going to see that real estate is going to dwindle. Um, you know that those are added costs that can be taken out of uh, you know doing business. And I think you're going to see more energy companies take uh, take advantage of that. Yeah, you recently launched a book, Grow with the Flow. Um, and I've heard you say it took you 20 years to write the book. So I guess part of it is a reflection of your journey. Uh, could you tell us a bit uh, about the most important messages you want to share with us through your book? Well, the book, it, you know, yeah, so it was interesting. I had a bucket list item, which was write a book. And I thought it would be great to write a book to, to leave something behind for, um, you know, my for my daughter. And little did I know when I started writing the book that, I'd go through cancer, I'd go through all these very difficult situations, per perhaps not even um, being able to have, you know, children. And so um, I finished the book actually after Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey was uh, marked a, a very a dark time in my uh, adult life where, you know, we lost our home, I lost the business. And so it was a great um, way for me to, to emerge out of that and to heal from that. And so um, I, you know, decided to, to finish the book, but the book is really about um, embracing difference and leveraging that difference, you know, to drive purpose and meaning in your work and life. And so it goes through, you know, uh, parts of my career, you know, when I've been uh, kicked in the face. So uh, my first job out of college, I lost uh, due to layoff and it was not my first. Uh, so going through layoffs, um, you know, are very familiar for me. I've been fired. So I have a, a chapter where I talk about, you know, going through that. Um, and then I talk about, you know, how um, Pink Petra was born and and the motivation to, you know, to launch uh, something and, and get out of my comfort zone and do something that would, uh, you know, that would make a difference. So my main mes messages really get back to uh, to that, you know, embracing difference, you know, finding your voice um, and finding your purpose in that. And and it was a lot of fun uh, to write. Um, my daughter and I are actually going chapter by chapter now, uh, and we're um, we're reading it together. She's nine, so we're having a lot of fun um, reading the chapters uh, at night. Um, but that those would be the the messages that I would um, you know impart. And that's really kind of the essence of the book. So the book launched in the middle of a pandemic, and I actually called my uh, my my team, uh, the editor and the publisher. And I said, maybe we should hold the book 
and just launch it later in the year. And this, and I said, let's, or I can maybe do a chapter on the pandemic, you know, cause it was really, it was hot, ready to go to the press just as things were um, falling apart with the uh, virus. And, and they said, Oh no, 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 that's, that'll be a second book. We've got to get this one published. So, uh, you know, I had 16, I had a 16 event tour planned. All of that has been canceled or put off. And I've got, I don't know, about 700 books right now in my husband's uh, man cave downstairs um, waiting to be uh, disseminated through the different events. So it's been it's been interesting to also release a book right about overcoming uh, fear and going through um, tough situations and resilience in the middle right of of a, you know, of a, of a crisis. So, um, I've learned a lot from writing the book and obviously I'm learning a lot from launching the book, uh, during the coronavirus. And it sounds like you learned a lot from different crises as well, although it's, they're hard to, to get through. And I also seen you refer to the, the P3, the people, passion and purpose. And I, I believe that's, you know, strongly connected to the things that you are engaged no, absolutely. You know, there's a whole chapter. Actually, the last chapter in the book is called E3 P3. And E3 P3 is 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 kind of this mantra around, um, you know, with equality, um, environment and economy, you know, we're going to create a new energy system. But all of that happens through people, passion and purpose. Um, you know, we're not going to get to uh, a, a cleaner world. We're not going to get to a more sustainable energy system uh, without it. And I'm very I was very inspired to uh, just as, as I was finishing the book, I had the opportunity to meet um, the actor Jeff Bridges, who um, is, is actually a, a big climate activist. He's uh, very interested in energy systems and, and and how energy works. And he put together a film that I had the chance to watch before I polished off the final um, uh, words for the book. And I was inspired because uh, his view of energy is like nobody else's I've seen, particularly uh, folks out of Hollywood. They tend to misrepresent you know, what our industry stands for. But I had the chance to talk with him. He participated in our recent conference just as the coronavirus was happening. We, um, we were wrapping up one of our uh, our conferences, our fifth anniversary conference, and uh, you know he says in his book, "Energy is the currency of life," and or or he says that in his movie. Um, and I, I I I can't think of anything more profound. I mean, energy is the currency of life. Energy drives us forward. Um, energy is also what's uh, slowed us down. Right? We've we've stopped you know with the activity. We've stopped you know flying on planes. We've stopped you know, visiting restaurants. And so obviously energy demand is down, but he argues, he makes an argument about um, a world where we can be productive, but we can also be clean, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful for the future. Um, I think that, that um, you know, I think that, that women, I think that people of different backgrounds are going to play a big role in this next era of energy and, and, you know, our economy. And so um, the last chapter in the book is kind of a tip to my hat off of what I think um, is to come from um, from energy. So, great. That's a, that's a great. We're approaching the end of unfortunately of a very interesting conversation. But people can make a difference. We need diversity, and and uh, energy can make a difference and, and yeah. does a lot of good for the world. And uh, so that was an optimistic and great note to finish it off from. Do you do you have any like final remarks, comments you want to share that we haven't touched on during our conversation before we wrap up? You know, I think I would just I think I would just say, um, you know, in darkness there there is light, and and this situation with the coronavirus is, and, and you know, our market and the energy industry in a in a um, in a down cycle, this will pass, and I believe that no matter what, we're going to need energy, and we're going to need people to be a part of uh, that solution. So, uh, I think those would be the the words I would would give. Uh, those were great final words. It was a great pleasure having you join us today, uh, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you to all the listeners of the ONS Energy Talks.